I'd just like to uh, also end by mentioning that as well as the AWARE study, um, we are also launching another study called BRAIN-1. BRAIN stands for Brain Resuscitation Advancement International Network, which is again through the 25 centers that we're working with currently. And this study really is at the other spectrum, whereas AWARE is predominantly looking at cognitive changes, mind and brain during cardiac arrest and even after cardiac arrest. This study is looking at pure physiology, pure biological function during cardiac arrest and will help us to improve the way that we treat patients and hopefully will help us to reduce any kind of brain damage or neurological deficit uh, that uh, can take place as a consequence of cardiac arrest. I won't be able to elaborate on this study, but just to mention that it's also happening at the same time. And furthermore, um, I'd also like to announce that um, working very closely with my colleagues here, uh, Professor Bruce Grayson is implementing uh, aspects of both Brain One and AWARE at the University of Virginia. Um, and also Dr. Mario Beauregard from the University of Montreal is uh, working very hard to implement a brand new study uh, which will be announced in the next few months, but I will just mention very briefly. Uh, it's called a, a study of mind, brain, and consciousness during deep hypothermic surgery. Now, this study involves looking at people who have had an induced flatline brain state due to the need to having critical surgery of either the brain or the heart. And in a subgroup of people, when they have this surgery, their bodies are cooled down to about 18 degrees Celsius. And as a consequence of this, their brain goes flat. You have no brain electrical activity. And um, we're very interested in this because there are anecdotal reports of people who have shown activity of their mind and consciousness uh, and the ability to see and hear exactly what was going on. So it's a complementary study to the AWARE study. Um, and we'd like to be able to test this hypothesis uh, in an alternative setting uh, as well. And um, just the final point to mention before I thank everybody is about the Human Consciousness Project. This is a collaboration of uh, different scientists, physicians, and academics from many centers around the world with an interest in understanding more about the mind, brain, and consciousness um, and how they interact together. And although there are some people working on solving the so-called problem of consciousness or the mind-body problem, uh, our group is also very interested in this, but we're also willing to try to test um, the theories that perhaps uh, in some way uh, the mind and consciousness is something that hasn't yet been discovered uh, and needs to be looked at in more lateral ways. And as you can see from the studies that we have developed so far, we're willing to test at least the hypothesis uh, that has been generated that maybe uh, the mind or consciousness may continue at least for a period of time when brain activity has ceased. We have experts from both critical care and resuscitation, uh, experts in neuroscience, neuroimaging, near-death experiences, um, immunology, molecular biology, mental health, counseling, psychiatry, all working together either on an advisory basis or actually as principal investigators uh, for the Human Consciousness Project. Uh, and this is being launched through the Division of Neuroscience of the University of Southampton. And um, I would just like to really end here. Uh, thank everybody for, for being here, for being so attentive. I'd also like to thank the Noor Foundation again, together with the uh, NGO section of the United Nations and the University of Montreal for organizing this uh, press conference and the symposium that's about to follow. And also to thank all our collaborators, both in the UK, uh, here in the US, and uh, we have one site in Austria. Um, I won't name them all just for, uh, to keep this brief, but all their details are on the website, the Mind Body Symposium website. So thank you very much. And we can take any questions if, uh, if there are any. I know that there's a large audience list, uh, watching this um, online, so um, if there are any questions in the audience here, then we're very happy to take them, either myself, Dr. Beauregard, or uh, Professor Pavla. When are you going to start the study in Montreal? We're waiting to uh, get the um, uh, approval from the Ethics Research Committee, so it might take a few months, I would say. We have um, a number of you know, complementary studies that we've designed, um, and these are just the beginning. Uh, because one of the questions that we have, to, we have to foresee is that, although really from a scientific point of view, I think it's very unlikely that people will see these images, because really it should not be happening. But nevertheless, we have to be open-minded um, and be prepared for something that may happen. So if one in a million, of course, this 
And the key thing is that we know nothing about human consciousness. We know nothing about how it relates to the brain. And although many people perceive that brain cells somehow generate thoughts, we have no scientific evidence to show how a brain cell, which produces electricity, can somehow generate this miracle of thought and consciousness.